Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming. Happy to be here. I want to talk to you today about deep learning for natural language processing. And in order to really appreciate how this is novel and why it's actually a lot better than a lot of traditional natural language processing, I'll start a little bit with a handful of slides on the past and the present of technology and, and what's out there, and then I go into and give a, a bit of an overview of, of what's possible now with deep learning in the natural language sort of understanding and processing space. So I think the main way uh, past approaches uh, have been sort of lacking is that they made various very strong simplifying assumptions. So what do I mean by this? Uh, one very common way to classify text is using so-called bag of words representations, where we basically have a count vector that is roughly the size of our vocabulary, and we ignore word order. So if I have, for instance, a sentence here, such as white blood cells destroying an infection, then I might just have you know, a very long 0, 1 vector that is the size of our vocabulary, and I have a 1 for all the words that actually appear in that sentence or document. And that can work reasonably well for some simple information retrieval task, where I just want to find all the documents that mention some words, or topic modeling, or some simple types of document level classification task, where I just want to know, you know, is this about sports or politics, right? There, you can get away with just saying, well, you know, I see Obama and president and, and the word politics, so it's probably in the politics class. And I see football and baseball, and it's probably sports. So, however, once you want to get at some harder problems, or maybe also classify shorter text for finer gradations inside a class, you run into trouble with this kind of representation. So here we have, uh, another sentence, uh, namely, an infection destroying white blood cells. And we want to, for instance, classify this as whether it being it's positive or negative if, it's, if you see that kind of phrase in, in your medical report. And now, white blood cells destroying an infection and an infection destroying white blood cells have basically the exact same bag of words representation. But in one case, if it's written in your report, you might live. In the other one, you might die. So it's a big difference. Yet the bag of words representation can't capture that. And similar things happen in other kinds of sentiment classification where it actually matters to understand the structure of the sentence. So if you have a, a movie review sentence, for instance, and it says, you know, this film doesn't care about cleverness, wit, or any other kind of intelligent humor. A lot of downstream models that you would build on top of this kind of representation that is just bag of words would basically count the positive words, subtract the negative words in some way, and say, overall, this is, you know, positive or negative. And so here you have you know, humor, intelligent, kind, wit, cleverness, care, lots of positive words, not really a negative word, yet the whole thing is really negative because of that one little doesn't uh, in front. And so ideally, we'll have models that will actually learn this kind of stuff just from seeing a lot of examples. And at the end of this, we'll actually can look at a live demo and see a model that will really solve that. Another way. You could try to simplify this. As instead of looking at the entire document, you only look at the specific fixed window size around a specific word that you like to classify. So for instance, if you want to classify the part of speech tag of a single word, for instance, here this center word, then you might want to, you know, it might be enough, it might be OK to just say, oh, there's a determiner in front of this. This is the, right, or a. And there are most cases, what follows after the is either an adjective or a noun, right? So you can get away with that. Uh, there's also other simple tasks like named entity recognition, where you just want to find if it's a location or a person or, or an organization, where you may also be able to get away with just looking at a fixed context. However, again, if you want to push beyond sort of these simple co-occurrence patterns and really get you know, beyond sort of 80% accuracy and really push towards 90 and above, then this kind of representation will also get you into trouble. So here we have another example from sentiment classification. And the sentence is, if you enjoy being rewarded. And you might say, all right, now this is a pretty positive phrase, you know, a fixed window size phrase that is positive by a script that assumes, often talking about scripts is uh, overall also associated with positivity in this corpus. But then the next window is, you aren't very bright. Now you want that window to really counteract the other previous two windows of the same size and really understand that overall this is a negative sentence. And again, here, if you have, you know, you see the movie title, Blood Work, probably realize it's not a high quality movie. So basically, 
these kinds of things, uh, you know, and the kinds of tasks where we can get away with this have been reasonably solved. And so I think right now we have a lot of commoditization where there are certain tools for simple tasks that just work incredibly well right out of the box. And so to give you an idea of, of such a tool, here's uh, one that is from my company Metamind, uh, where we basically allow you to classify tweets and, and any other kind of text. And so here I just, uh, before the talk, I search for Uber Pool, and it will basically give you, you know, how many uh, of the last, in the last couple of days, how many tweets uh, were, that mentioned Uber Pool were neutral, positive, or negative. This is a, you know, the simple sort of sentiment analysis case. And you can basically see that it's, in many cases, quite accurate. And yeah, so here we have, you know, talk about greenwash. I guess they said, you know, Earth Day, Uber Pool. Of course, like, buses and trains might still be better, so people were unhappy about that, um, at least for the environment, maybe not for your time. Um, and then, uh, you know, here are some, some positive things where people had a positive experience using Uber. So this is one specific, specific kind of example. Uh, and it turns out that if you wanted to train your own classifier, you can also do this very, very easily right now. It's basically gone to just drag, drop, and learn uh, with, with MetaMind's uh, technology here. So all you need to do is find a very, like, define a very simple text file where you have your labels, a tab character, and some text. And then you can basically train a classifier that predicts those kinds of labels. And that could be, you know, buy, sell. It could be happy customer, unhappy customer. This could be this is a pool um, versus appliance versus painting kind of request. Any kind of label you could associate with a simple text, uh, you can basically train with this. So all you need to do is you create a text file. Here it's positive and negative, and the the type of text is a movie review. And you basically, yeah, you have two options. One is you just write seven lines or so of Python code where you say, here I have my, um, my specific data set. I create a classification model. And you know, this actually works for images and text. And then you basically type model.fit, and that's it. So in seven lines of Python code, you could create you own, but you don't even need to have any code. You can just take this file I just showed you and drag and drop it into the browser and then click on Upload and Train. And now it will basically, depending on how fast uh, the Wi-Fi is, all right, um, upload it, extract features, and then save a model into a production-ready setting such that you can now have, you know, in just three lines of testing code, a production level classifier. It will tell you a little bit about uh, some of the statistics. If you go in here, this is a little bit of a noisy data set, so you won't, and it's not that big, but it basically gets you to roughly 70%, 77%, and will compare different kinds of algorithms, give you some statistics on your data set, and then allow you to kind of do some error analysis and see where it works and where it fails. Right, so basically, in the last you know, one minute, we trained a simple text classifier on an arbitrary problem. So I feel like this is now relatively commodity. There's still some you know, work if you want to, uh, for, for a lot of other kinds of uh, settings, uh, if you want to have a production level you know, system, it might take you extra work. And this is something that we do at MetaMind right away also. But there are lots of tools that can get you a little bit there, uh, most of the way there. So now. What, what's the promise of deep learning? Why, why should we use deep learning when, you know, well, there's some deep learning in this also, but in general, you know, there are lots of tools that can allow you to do a simple text classification. And I think one of the nice ec examples and example applications to really help you understand where it shines and how it allows you, why it allows you to push beyond sort of this 80% accuracy number and, and go higher and higher is sentiment analysis. So basically, if you want to have detailed, fine-grained sentiment, it's still not quite solvable. You saw this you know, very simple, straightforward classifier that works for any language and uh, any length of document only got you to 77. And so what we now also have is basically deep learning-based uh, sentiment analysis and other kinds of text classifiers. And 
when is this important? Well, if you just want to get a rough idea, you know, are people on general, in general, sort of more positive or more negatively inclined about a new product, then maybe you can get away with just 80% accuracy. But once there are decisions that are really important, you know, in medicine or in financial trading and things like that, then you really want to get those extra five to 10% of accuracy. And this is what deep learning allows you to do. So um, I mentioned finance. This is an interesting example where we got a glimpse in the world of that, you know, this is actually happening uh, in finance. So here Anne Hathaway in 2011 starred in a movie. The movie reviews came out. And then all of a sudden, the stocks for the company Berkshire Hathaway went up significantly. And so we see here that this is clearly already being done. And in this case, you know, you had the wrong entity disambiguation and uh, the wrong kind of sentiment about, or the right sentiment, but about the wrong entity. And so this is a nice example of where this also fails. I think for very simple and very long documents, sort of general reviews, right, we can get up to 90%, uh, even if it's a very simple kind of problem. But once you want to really understand fine-grained sentiment about specific entities uh, from just a single sentence or a single tweet, then it gets more and more important to really understand the details. So if your document is very large, you know, and somebody really tries to convey that they liked um, a certain product or a certain movie, then they'll have lots of obvious words in there, and you can kind of get away with it. Um, for single sentences, for instance, there was this interesting uh, data set from Pang and Lee from 2005. And until deep learning came around, the accuracy had basically never reached above 80% over seven years of research on this data set in the re uh, academic community. And what we basically found when we analyzed this is that once you want to push a b beyond 80, you really have to get the harder cases right. And there are interesting problems with neg negation and the scope of negation and other semantic effects. So let me give you two examples here. We already covered this one. And what I mean by negation scope is here that when you say it doesn't pair, that doesn't has a scope over the entire rest of the sentence. But it might not, right? You might have a comma and then say something else again. And here we have an interesting uh, so-called contrastive conjunction. That's the word but, that's the linguistic term for it. And the sense is it's not life-affirming, it's vulgar and mean, but I liked it. And so you might say, again, from just a simple you know, counting up words, it is negative. But with this contrastive conjunction, when you have these and you say x but y, then usually the sentiment of y matters more than that of x. And so one thing that you very quickly learn when you work with deep learning is that it needs more data. Uh, so you're giving it basically less information. You're not telling it, these are all my positive words, and let me write this regular expression here. And if I see not followed by these 10 words, then it's really negative. And then if I see doesn't, and maybe doesn't plus some verb, then you, know, you don't give it any of this information. You just give it a bunch of examples. And you're asking it now to learn as much as you have as a person from just those examples. And so basically what you often want to do is either find clever ways to collect deep learning data from various sources or just use Amazon Mechanical Turk or Crowdflower to just basically give more annotation to your data set. And so this is what we've done. And we essentially collected, you barely see here the, the lines, we've collected these tree structures where we have all the uh, syntactically plausible phrases and we labeled them separately. So here we have life affirming, it's positive, not life affirming becomes negative, vulgar is negative, and this is basically a very negative overall phrase, and then you say but, and then it kind of relativizes the sentiment. So we basically collected some more data. Nowadays you can basically collect uh, hundreds of thousands of labels for English in, in a matter of a day or two thanks to Amazon Mechanical Turk and, and other kinds of platforms like that. And then we can use deep learning. And I can't really go into too many details here on the algorithm. If you're actually interested in this, I'm also teaching a class right now at Stanford, and all the material is available. Uh, so if you go to cs224d.stanford.edu, I'll put the URL up uh, at the end again. You can really understand all the details of, this, uh, of these kinds of models. But on a high level, what's going on when you try to use deep learning to understand this kind of sentence? You can still use uh, things like word vectors, which we just heard about, um, and classify single words as a first step. So here you would say, all right, not and bad 
you know, bad is pretty negative. Not bad, not by itself, often appears in negative context, so it might be a little negative too. And pretty could be, you know, the pretty as in beautiful or the pretty as in somewhat of an attenuator. So maybe if the, the model might think in most cases it's seen as beautiful, so it might say this word by itself in isolation is very positive. Smart is very positive and actually it's just a neutral word. Now, what there are different kinds of deep learning models. Uh, here we look at a so-called recursive neural tensor network. Um, I'm mildly biased uh, in that choice because I invented the model a couple of years ago uh, during my PhD at Stanford. But basically what this model would now do is it would find syntactically plausible phrases and actually combine them and not just average you know, the sentiment that you have, but use these word vectors, these you know, high dimensional uh, lists of numbers essentially, and really understand how they combine to form the meaning of now that bigram. So here you have not bad, and it actually learns that despite both of those being negative, when you say not bad in that combination, it actually becomes a neutral phrase. And likely, uh, similarly here, it learns that pretty by itself might be very positive, but in the case of pretty smart, it actually is somewhat of an attenuator, like quite smart or somewhat smart. And it learned that that only, you know, it's not very positive, but just somewhat positive. And then it also learns that as you combine things with, you know, more neutral words, depending on what those neutral words are, depending on where they are in this high dimensional vector space, it stays positive. And basically it can build up this entire structure up until it knows the final sentiment of the full sentence. Are there any questions so far? Right. Um, that's a great question. So the question is sort of, do we have intuition for that vector space? Yes. Uh, if you if you train um, if you train word vectors based purely on sentiment, uh, they actually look a little different. Um, you can actually initialize them with glove or word to vec, and that can help in, in some cases. If your data set is large enough, the, and it's just about sentiment, then the larger your data set is, the less necessary it is to initialize um, the model with these pre-trained word vectors, but you can still do it. it. It rarely ever hurts, so if you have them around already, you may as well. Once you propagate a lot of sentiment into the word vectors, they start to get better and better at predicting that and you know, understanding how they should interact in the composition. And then they move around in the vector space differently. And we can gain some intuition uh, by visualizing this properly. And so here you see a two-dimensional projection of that usually you know, 25 to 300 dimensional vector space. And on the first principal component here, you basically see that, uh, and I'll zoom in in a second, but up here we have very positive words, and down here we have very negative words. And in the center we have lots of content words. So if we now zoom in here, you can see, you know, down here you have, you know, jokes, tries, problem, TV. So, you know, this is a movie review. So if you, the movie comes out and somebody mentions, you know, should go straight to TV instead of wasting your time in a movie theater, it's not very positive. Uh, pretentious, lacking, awful, and so on. And then as you move through the space, you see more and more sort of neutral terms, animation, and novel, belief, you know, and so on, along occasionally beyond. And then as you move higher up into the space, you see more and more positive words, such as beautiful, journey, terrific, manages, intelligent, and so on. And here the color actually comes from just a pure classification. So unfortunately, for instance, while intelligent is somewhere uh, similar in a similar part of the vector space and close to terrific, by itself it's actually unfortunately not that positive. Yes? That's exactly right. So everything in this model, and this is again sort of a part of, of something that you really want to in internalize when you work with deep learning, everything is learnable. Like you really want to give it as raw of an input as possible and the output that you care about and you let it figure out everything in between and that includes in this case the word vectors. Yeah, great question. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. 
That's a great question. I'll actually, I'll show you an example. Um, actually, maybe we can pull up an example right away. Uh, so the question is, what is, what about the scope of negation? Can we actually capture this um, in a principled way? And so here we have, um, we have exam an, a but example. So let's uh, think. I typed that in already. Um, so this is the example sentence that I gave you. And here you see um, how this works and how the scope of the negation can really be captured because of the tree very easily. So here you have, this movie doesn't care about cleverness, wit, or any other kind of intelligent humor. And basically, this model was able to learn that, yes, indeed, these are all positive things here. And you can care about all these. And it's positive. Once you don't care about them, or this movie doesn't care, then it becomes negative. And that is exactly the kind of negation scope uh, that this model can, can learn by itself. All right, so where does that leave us in terms of the accuracy? Basically, uh, you can use more data helps always, and it helps every single model. So if you really don't feel like developing any kind of new algorithm, you just want to get slightly like 1% higher performance, the simplest thing you can always do is go to Amazon Mechanical Turk and just collect more data for your problem. So all the models benefit from this additional data. However, the recursive neural tensor network benefits the most. And there are now sort of nice extensions. Uh, don't want to go into too many details there, but there's so-called long short-term memories that uh, is a different way to compose the vectors. And you can use those in both uh, sort of temporal chain structures and tree structures, and that works even better. But we're not going to go into too many details recursive there. Or recurrent? Recursive. All of these are recursive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a constituency parse, but there are, there are deterministic mappings between the two. Uh -huh. uh, so are you also at the same time training whatever the constituency is? That's a great question. So when we have these kinds of tree structures, the question is, should we learn the tree structure at the same time that we learn the sentiment? And it turns out that you could do that, uh, but it doesn't gain you much. And there are now very efficient, also based on deep learning, parsers that are uh, you know, linear in the sequence length and the, their complexity. And so you don't, you can just assume the parser is fixed. You don't need right. to learn it. I guess I'm talking more about like, if you're in your domain, mm -hmm. you might have weird sentence structures that isn't uh, closing Twitter, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true, and I was worried too. We are uh, we're running a bunch of experiments uh, on on Twitter data as well. Somewhat surprisingly, it it still works really really well. Uh, I think the parse structure is essentially, you know, you can get some things wrong sometimes, and it doesn't hurt you very much. The only time it really hurts you is if you have uh, a parser mistake that's so bad that, for instance, in this case of um, of the sentence right here, it it said you know sort of doesn't care. And it put that very deep down in the tree, maybe down here. And now you see sort of how, you know, if this was actually, if it mis misparsed the sentence and put the doesn't somewhere deep down inside the sub, sub, sub tree, it will eventually not be able to overpower the rest of it. Um, but in general, especially for Twitter, the sentences aren't that long, so the, the tweets, so you can get away with that. Yeah, great question. Uh, so we can, we basically here uh, pushed what, you know, for over seven years on the data set was below 80 to 80. And now with some more advanced deep learning techniques, actually to 86 uh, and, and even up to like 88. Um, we can also look at some more specific subsets where we know you really have to capture the right structure and understand a little bit more about um, the, the semantics of the English language in order to get them right. And here we have a subset of the data where we have these X but Y constructions. And there are 131 cases, and basically, the simpler models here, like bigram naive Bayes, are really, really bad. And uh, you know, then you can use various deep learning techniques and get higher and higher. So these kind of accuracies here are, do you get the left side correct, you get the right side correct, and do you get at the conjunction is also correct. So once you have you know, even 90% you know, or so, and basically multiply you know, 0.9 times 0.9 times 0.9. Um, and so this is actually now also even, uh, this is you know, uh, a number from the original paper, and this has, has improved now also significantly to uh, around 60. So here's some more interesting negation results. Uh, Roger Dodger, um, some silly movie. Um, 
And basically, in this particular data set, uh, humans were asked to change the sentence very minimally and change the entire sentiment of it. So the simpler your model is, the more it just kind of averages all the words, the harder uh, time it will have to really solve this, this kind of task well. And so here, uh, Roger Dodger's one of the most compelling variations on this theme is positive, and Roger Dodger's one of the least compelling variations on this theme. It immediately learns that you know, at least one word difference here makes all the difference for the entire sentence. So least compelling versus most compelling changes things a lot. And here we can look a little bit into the internals. So here we have uh, negation of negatives. And what's interesting is that uh, first we thought, oh, maybe all the fancy deep learning stuff, all it's done is it learned that whenever you seek any kind of negation word and anything positive, it'll just make everything more negative, right? So not great, not good, not cool. Just all, everything becomes more negative once you see not. And so uh, fortunately, we, we then, you know, uh, discovered that really it, it does more than just that. So not by itself here was negative. Bad by itself is very negative. And this is sort of the distribution over the different classes that is internal to the model. And it really says this is mostly neutral with a slight hint of positive once you combine the two words to not and bad. And that's really the only model that we found that actually captured that effect to put more probability mass onto the neutral and positive classes when you combine a negative statement with a negation. All right, so, so far we basically were able to see that there, these deep learning models can capture some compositional meaning and jointly learn these tree structures, the feature representations, we didn't have to you know, give it you know, regular expressions or anything like that, and learn any kind of language prediction task. Sentiment analysis in the grand scheme of things, while you know, it gets harder and harder, you have to understand more and more about your data if you want to you know, push towards 90%, it's still in the grand scheme of things a reasonably simple task especially compared to things like machine translation or question answering. So here, the second task that we'll look at is question answering. It's actually a fun competition, sort of like Jeopardy, but mostly for, for high schoolers and, and college students. Uh, it's called the Quiz Bowl Challenge. It's basically a trivia competition. The more knowledge you have about trivial things, I mean, some of them are less trivia uh, than others. You know, this is important literature and geography and things like that, but then there's also things like sports and uh, other stuff. Uh, so here, does anybody have an idea of who, who this is? All right, very good. Um, so basically, the structure of this is that in the beginning, the first sentence, you need to know, maybe you need to have actually read one of his books, right? And really know that you know, there's a, you know, some unfinished novel, title character, forges his father's signature, get out of school. You know, it's like you really have to remember all the books of all the many authors that are out there and, and all their plot lines to really get this right. And then it gets simpler and simpler, and at the very end of the sentence, it's just like, all right, it's a German author. You know, before that, it could have been, you know, like lots of different, could have been a Chinese uh, short story or something. Um, German author, and you basically give it, you know, the actual books he has written. And at that point, you just need to have a higher level knowledge and like, have heard of him and heard of like, the most important book um, that he's written. So one thing that's really amazing is you know, I, I described this recursive model for sentiment. And I'm glad everybody found their way. <laughs> um, the amazing thing here is that the exact same model I described for sentiment will actually also solve question answering. Uh, so we use that exam, exact same type of recursive neural network, and now instead of training it to predict at the top of the sentence here a sentiment, we're just training it to predict the actual answer of these trivia competitions. So in this case, you know, uh, we would like to have the root vector of that model be trained to predict the vector of Thomas Mann. And you know, we can basically see here a couple of different uh, distances of the various phrases that we have inside uh, these parse trees. And at the very root here, you can kind of see, all right, Thomas Mann is the highest scoring uh, character, for instance, of the first sentence. And then various other sort of more similar, also German authors come next. And then you know, Henry James, who's a British author, comes after, after them. And so we can combine um, the original training data here. So this is, you know, tr assume you only have 
the training data in this kind of format. Uh, and of course, there, you have to have seen all the various aspects of Thomas Mann in order to be able to answer it. But what if you, you know, in the test set, you have facts that weren't mentioned ever in the training set about Thomas Mann. So here, the trick is to also train this kind of model on Wikipedia and the actual Wikipedia articles of those authors or those historic events or those presidents or you know, sports uh, players and so on. So whoever has a Wikipedia article, you can also train the model and try to predict the facts um, uh, in the Wikipedia articles. And so again, now we can visualize the vector space. And what's interesting here is that you now capture very different things in the vector space. You know, you propagate sentiment into it. You push, you know, in movie reviews, you get TV and pretentious and horrible somewhere in the space. You propagate historical facts into the vectors and try to predict you know, presidents, and then you will see that you know, Woodrow Wilson and Ronald Reagan and Jimmy Carter are in a similar area of the vector space. And this is, again, sort of a big takeaway message here. Whatever tasks you have, you can propagate the information of that task into these word vectors and into these compositional models like recursive neural networks, and then they will try to ingest as much information as possible in order to solve your prediction task. What's also kind of amazing is that uh, this recursive neural network model can actually defeat human players in some cases. So here you have each column is basically one game that a person played against the computer, and whenever it's blue, the model wins. And, and maybe nowadays this is not so amazing because we've seen Jeopardy and, and IBM's Watson system. But the difference here is IBM's Watson system was built over many years by a gigantic team with you know, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, you know, to, to work with. And this was built by one grad student using deep learning. <laughs> right? this, that gives you a little bit of like, an idea of the power of you know, learning the features automatically based on your task with deep learning versus going in and writing regular expressions, coming up with lists of words that are important for your task, and so on. Once you, you just, the, the amount of speed you can get um, to a really good solution is just incredible. And so, so far I've talked about two tasks that are basically only inside language, but what's cool is we can also learn grounded meaning representations. And what I mean by that is that we can connect these word vectors to visual things that we see in the world. And so, again, uh, the amazing thing here is that that same model I described uh, for sentiment analysis the same one that was used for question answering is the same one that we can now use to try to map sentences into a part of the vector space in which we've also mapped images into. And we try to learn that they're both, they should be very close to each other. They're both very similar in the vector space. So what we have here is a training corpus where we say, for instance, a man wearing a helmet jumps on his bike near a beach. We use a recursive neural network model to project this into a vector space. And then we take, and this is a different model, I can't go over it in too many details, it's a convolutional neural network, it's also a different type of deep learning algorithm, and we take the raw pixels of an image, we map it through this convolutional neural network, and we train the model to say both of these vectors should be very close to one another. And then that's, that's the only thing we tell this model. Everything else, it again, learns and has to backpropagate through the network update all these various uh, parameters of the models such that that will really be the case. And so here are some examples of one going one direction, which is I give you an image, and now you have a very large pool of sentences, and you try to find the sentences that best describe that image. And so here you have you know, a jockey rides a brown and white horse and a dort curl, and then you know, the, the next two are actually not correct. So in this particular data set, there are usually five sentences describing each image, and you, know, you can just select the best one. Uh, and then you know, the, the third one is also wrong, and you know, quite so, and then the fourth one is again correct. And you can kind of see here also, this is kind of funny, the very first sentence that uh, was picked by the model to visualize or describe this, this image was correct, but then here you have a couple of things that are wrong, and you can kind of see that the way you would want to uh, analyze your accuracy is a little tricky because while this sentence, for instance, seems kind of funny to a human reader, an elderly woman catches a ride on the back of a motorcycle, and it's kind of ridiculous because it's motocross and 
be quite dangerous for her spine. Um, however, in general, if you took out elderly, it is a person that, you know, is, you know, or taking a ride on the back of something that looks like a bicycle from afar, maybe, right? So it's like, in terms of n-gram overlap, it's not so bad. Um, so we can actually look at uh, a demo of this that we sometimes bring up. Um, we basically here uh, can type in any kind of sentence and or phrase. So this one is a couple sitting on a couch. And it will now pull in images. And the closer the image is to the center text box, the closer these vectors are in the joint vector space. So I can type here, uh, for instance, bird. And it will show me pictures of a single bird. That is kind of the standard image classification, just one label for each image. But now I can say uh, birds, for instance, in plural. And now it actually shows me images of multiple birds. And again, the only thing this model has seen were lots of training examples of sentences and images. It doesn't actually tell you in, for each sentence you know, where that particular object is or anything. So uh, this is what, what the data set looks like for training here. You have lots of different kinds of things, like a cat lying, laying on a red cushion looking at the camera, and so on. Lots of, lots of training examples. Um, and now the model has to pick up these things by itself. So here, uh, we started with bird. And now we say birds. And the model actually has some sense of plurality and actually now shows you pictures of multiple birds. Then you can go to birds on water. And now it shows you mostly pictures of birds that are actually on water. And you, know, you can change this to different things like birds in trees, now we'll try to find the images that are actually of birds and trees. And this is, I would love to put this demo up, but you kind of have to know what kinds of things the model has seen. So if you type in like a zebra on a red bus, then you know, it'll just show you something random. Uh, and it'll have a low score, but it will look pretty terrible, right? Uh, so you kind of have to know what kinds of things this model has seen. Because again, there, there's, there's, very, there's basically no human engineering here. It just sees a bunch of pixels and a bunch of sentences together with those pixels, and has to really capture all the rest. Uh, so we can have. Yeah, so this is uh, if you actually have um, a related problem like that, then this is something you can work with us to, to work into your products. Yeah. And it'll be like easy APIs and so on to, to do. So here we have horse, and you can go all the way to like horse next to bald man. And it actually finds that one image in the data set where a bald man is next to a horse. All right. Uh, with that, I want to conclude. Basically, I hope I could you know, get you excited to explore deep learning, uh, largely because deep learning can learn grounded representations in, the terms of, uh, in terms of images, as well as compositional representations to really understand how words are put together, not just classifying them in isolation, not ignoring the word order that is clearly important to natural language, but really understanding how words compose the meaning of longer utterances. And that combination can be you know, employed in a variety of different tasks that you require either world or visual knowledge. And sorry for not being able to go into too many details for those of you who are more familiar with these models, but uh, if you're very interested in actually you know, understanding all the equations and how these models work. I'm teaching right now a class uh, at Stanford called Deep Learning for Natural Language Processing, and uh, all the material is up online, and you can read things there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think we have two minutes for questions or so. Right. Uh, so, so the question is, you know, can you actually make these models scalable compared to very simple baselines? And uh, the the answer is, when I was a PhD student at Stanford, and the, the model that you can download with the code, I didn't care that much about speed because I didn't run it on millions of documents. Now we're a company, and we have customers who want to classify millions or even billions of uh, uh, items each month, and we worked on on the speed, and now we have models that are a lot faster, basically. Almost as fast. You can't really beat, you know, just counting each word and, and summing it up. But um, you know, not many orders of magnitude slower anymore uh, compared to simple models, and they still have uh, a much much better accuracy. So yes, uh, a lot has improved. Yes, uh, in some cases it's based on GPUs, but in other cases, even without GPUs, we can have very very fast deep learning models. Now.
but those are proprietary. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, I mean train, sorry, for the, the time or the accuracy? Oh, um, so yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. So oftentimes the training uh, is often slower than, than testing. Um, and so that model is just, it's just a better model that is faster at both training and testing. In many cases, we don't optimize that much for training speed. Um, you can kind of, you kind of saw what, you know, when I, when I drag and drop this file into the browser and it already is really fast, right? Um, that was also a reasonably small data set. It only had like, I think, 10,000 or so lines, and uh, that's a few seconds. Uh, but we still want to train on like many millions of lines, and there, um, there are certain things that we have where if you go beyond, beyond, beyond a certain level, we'll, we'll talk to you uh, in person and maybe put it on our own uh, very beefy machines to, to speed it up even further. We often, we often compare different models and actually see. And, and oftentimes, there's, there's sort of a couple of simpler models that we try for free. Uh, and then once you say, all right, but I really want to have you know, these 5%, and I, I need you to guarantee me it's above 90 on like, a, any random sample of 10% like, of my data, we'll talk to you, and then we'll, we'll, we'll do some extra magic. <laughs> Sarcasm is a very interesting question. It comes up, uh, it comes up a lot. And, and uh, when I'm teaching this class, there are all the students have, have class projects. And, and there's, every year, there are some students who say, like, I want to work on sarcasm detection. And the, the first question I have is, do you have a data set? Uh, and that usually kills, yeah. that kills 95% of the, the projects. The other problem is that in many cases, sarcasm, you can get some things very simply. Like, you say, comma, yeah, right. Right? And then, you know, whatever happened before, it's probably you meant it as a joke and you're being sarcastic. But uh, in order to really do well on sarcasm, you have to know a lot more about the person, you know, like saying what you want to classify, right? I can have two friends and they both say the exact same word, which is, I had a great weekend coding the entire time. And one hates his job and uh, wants to, like, you know, he's obviously being sarcastic because he would have much rather go hang gliding. And the other one is, like, a super hardcore geek. He loves coding. And any waking moment he has, he, he wants to do it. And so, you know, is, can you know that from just looking at that sentence? No. You really have to understand sort of a long history of people, how often are they sarcastic, what are their preferences, and so on. So it's, it's a pretty complex problem, which is mostly lacking interesting data sets to really make a headway on it. That's a great question. So yes, uh, you can actually very easily incorporate almost any kind of external thing. So here we had, for images, right, we just basically, in deep learning, everything is a vector. And it turns out everything in the world can be made into a vector, um, which is, you know, it's kind of crazy to say that, um, but it's, it's very true. And so anything that you can put into a vector, you can now add at you know, any given layer of any deep learning model, and then it will start incorporating that too. And you can learn different vectors also for movies. And we've done that actually also. We have a paper um, from, I think, a year or two ago where we train on learning whether two entities are in specific relationships, like cat has part tail. So has part is a relationship, tail is a vector, cat is a vector. And you learn and push uh, these kinds of facts into, into these vectors. But I guess in this case, I'm talking about sort of heterogeneous So, so these kinds of models give you vector representations for the text. And in the table, you can also put into vector space by saying every entity in that table, every row, every you know, cell in the table is, can be represented as a vector. And then whether two entities in a table are actually you know, in the table or not can be a classification problem. And then you can put everything together. Um, I have a paper I can uh, point you to afterwards. Uh, it's called uh, Learning um, Knowledge-Based Representations. All right, I think we'll, we'll have to end here, but I'll be happy to chat uh, after. All right. <laughs> one last one. It turns out surprisingly little. Even on Twitter, it works. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.